invite Dr. Bob Gould, who's past president of Physicians for Social Responsibility and president of the San Francisco Bay chapter of PSR since 1989. He's an associate adjunct professor at UCSF School of Medicine, and he's been a leader of the Peace Caucus of, Am of the American Public Health Association since 1986. He has authored numerous publications on the health impacts of nuclear weapons and the role of health professionals in promoting environmental health, peace, and justice for all. Thank you, Bob. Thank you, and I, I can't say how much I appreciate being able to be here with all of my comrades here to make such a statement for peace and an end to the nuclear error which we need to uh, proceed on. I'm here today representing PSR in addition to our continued work with all of our partners here to work for a world without nuclear weapons to provide a little bit of context of the situation that we're in in terms of what do these nuclear weapons serve? How do they how do they buttress our military military position, our militarist thrust in the world, which is a very dangerous thing, particularly when we have to build the capacity to do all of our world's global health problems, all the challenges we have on climate change. One of the things that we have to think about in terms of putting this all into context and how all these nuclear expenditures serve us to have the ultimate level of violence in terms of the militarization that goes on and is manifested by the NATO alliance structure that just in July declared once again that nuclear weapons are the underpinning of the alliance. We will continue to work on developing nu nuclear weapons whereby NATO declared that if, as long as nuclear weapons exist, and these are the very countries, together with Russia and China and other nuclear weapon states, that are refusing to support the ban on nuclear weapons, that as long as nuclear weapons exist, NATO will remain a nuclear alliance. And this is extremely dangerous because, A, the counter-reaction that this has in terms of Russia with its own nuclear weapons modernization project, and of course, the old 1.7 or so trillion dollars that we're expected to spend on nuclear weapons, a cost of $4 million an hour over the next 30 years that should be going to deal with our health problems, to deal with uh, climate change. The NATO countries add to our 600 odd billion dollars a year, the largest military ex budget in the world, not counting the amounts of money that we spend for war, the NATO countries add another $300 billion. So there's $900 billion of $1.7 trillion of world military expenditures this year. That constitutes $230 for every human being on the planet in terms of this waste of our resources. And of this, so much of this is fueling conflicts around the world, ranging from Syria, other areas around the world whereby just this last year, the Stockholm, uh, in, the Stockholm International Peace Research Institute reported that $100 billion of arms sales around the world, from which our country rose from the previous period between 2013 and 2017, constant rising to a third of those expenditures, about 58% of our nearest arms dealer, the Russians, are, are providing in this world. And France, Germany, NATO allies, as well as China, follow in that in that as well. These armed conflicts are large. Are, are this, these arms are fueling conflicts, particularly in the areas of the Middle East, with NATO countries constituting 98 percent of the weapons going into the Middle East, fueling these types of conflicts, and which is key to what has unfortunately been this deadly mechanism of the global economy is the petrodollar for arms transit that's fueling the world and destroying so many lives. And one great example of that, of course, is the, the, the pledge to have $100 billion in arms to the Saudis who are continuing to pump oil, being encouraged by our government to do more while we squeeze Iran with sanctions and upend that nuclear 
deal in order to play with the Saudis and have them continue to pump even more oil. These are the things that we have to think about in terms of what is the future for our planet? What is, the, what is going to be the future of my eight-year-old grandson and all of our grandchildren in terms of the world that we're inheriting here? We know from the Institute of Policy Studies that we're thinking about the global needs that we have, global security. When that's, that's only defined in military terms by our country, where in terms of paying the comparison of what we're spending on military arms around the world instead of climate security, we're only spending 2% to, towards dealing with the climate compared with a world awash with weapons. Our generation, our future generation, can no longer stand for this absolute corruption of our country the way that we're wasting our resources when we need to deal with our urgent problems now. Over the weekend, the New York Times talked about our lost decade in the 1970s and 1980s, where we could have done something about climate, but the greed of the oil companies and many of the corporations that these military conflicts support are continuing uh, to go on. We need a new world where we can actually deal with the real problems. Penny is going to be talking about the real urgency of us dealing with our climate. We need to do this now, and that's the connection. We need an end to the mil end to this type of militarism, the end of speaking, uh, the, the end of spending this amount of money, so we can have a world that we can live in and thrive in. Thank you.